Okay. So welcome everybody. And it's been quite difficult to getting in here. We came from the station and there were so many places we couldn't turn left and turn right. And I don't know where you find the parking, but thank you for finding the parking. So there may be some people coming in late, that doesn't really matter. So we're going to start by doing a little bit of guided meditation, first of all. And for my relations from uh, Liverpool, you may remember that that year that Leicester City won the Premiership, you know why, don't you? Because they had Buddhist monks uh, chanting for them and meditating for them for the whole season. So, because I was uh, got Liverpool blood in me, if uh, the group over in Anfield, they want to do better next year, please make sure you invite me to Anfield to do some chanting. Okay. <laughs> I think they're doing pretty well as they are. Yeah, okay, deal. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we're going to start with some guided meditation. If you haven't meditated before, not to worry. I will give all the guidance. And you can, a lot of times when I give the meditation, people get so relaxed, they fall asleep. So you can catch up on some of your sleep if you wish to. Otherwise, they just follow the instructions and just relax to the max. Okay? So sitting down comfortably, it's only for 15 minutes. Oh yeah, is the sound okay with everybody? No one can hear, that's why they don't respond. Is the sound okay with everybody? Yes, yes very good. Sorry? A bit louder at the back. No, people like it at the back because if they don't like the talk, they can get out earlier. <laughs> but anyhow, I know that many of you are just getting the sound correct. Many of you know that I tell bad jokes. That's part of Liverpool in me. <laughs> You know, my dad used to tell terrible jokes all the time. But anyway, how many letters are there in the English alphabet? <laughs> how many letters are there in the English alphabet? 25. <laughs> Don't spoil the joke. How many letters in the alphabet? 26. 26. I can only remember 25. I don't remember why. <laughs> <laughs> you can go now if you want. <laughs> so anyhow, <laughs> that was just checking out the sound. So first of all, close your eyes. And with your eyes closed, make sure you're sitting comfortably. And by comfortably, I mean making sure your feet feel comfortable, your legs are comfortable. So you can move, keep your eyes closed because you can move your feet and your legs with your eyes closed and you're far more sensitive. You want to make sure that your feet and legs are as comfortable as possible. So you can push your feet away from the chair or tuck them into the chair, move them apart. Whatever is best for you. This is not just relaxation, this is also developing the important parts of meditation called kindness and mindfulness, what we call kindfulness. You're aware of your position of your legs and you find the best position for them so you can really relax. And then you check your butt, you know, sitting on the seat. If you wish to fidget, now's the time to fidget, at the beginning. So you can find the best position, so it's not going to disturb you later. And then you can check your back. Sometimes you can lean back on the chair if you're comfortable, sometimes you can just sit up straight, whichever works for you. So you can try, no, both. 
I'm stretching my back now, so it's nice and uh, vertical. Sometimes you feel like sitting back and leaning against a chair. Whichever is the best for you. Then we do a very important part of the meditation. We just scan our body, going you know, from the, the base of your torso and up towards the shoulders. And as you go up that body, if you can see anything there which is tight, tense, painful or unusual, just pause at that point. And as you pause at that point, see if you can relax that part of the body. Just imagine it opening up, stretching out rather than be afraid of it and tightening up that part of your body. Relax to the max. And often, you can relax your own body. It may be painful, it may be just had an operation, it may be some cancer there somewhere, and you can see it before even the doctor can see it. You can feel it. You know your body. And it's not just knowing it. You can give it this wonderful kindness. And that kindness relaxes the body totally. And so even things you thought you could not relax, it may be like a stomach, you've got a stomach ache, or it may be your lungs, it may be just congested. You imagine them and relax them as much as you can. How do you relax them? When you are aware, the awareness, the mindfulness gives you feedback. You do one thing, and then you see whether it gets more relaxed or more tense. And go for the relaxation. And you soon learn how to relax your own body so deeply. And when you go to your shoulders, which might be tense, imagine those as two bundles of strings on either side of your spine. It's like somebody is pulling them apart, stretching them. Just imagine they get released. You let go. You relax your shoulder blades. When you do, you feel so much easier. You may go down your arms, I'm doing this quite fast, down the arms, if you have any injuries or wounds there, pause, just give it your own kindness. And when you do, it relaxes so deeply. Is everything comfortable in your arms? and your hands. If it is, then go up from your arms to your shoulders again, making sure your head is not too far to the left or the right, not too far forward or back. So the neck feels relaxed. And last of all, go to your face. Are the muscles around your eyes and mouth tense? That usually shows some emotion like fear, anxiety, invading your mind and stretching the features on your face. So see if you can relax. So the muscles around the eyes are nice and loose, but the eyes are still closed. Around the mouth, it's nice and loose and relaxed. That is like showing you that your body is pretty at ease. And enjoy the feeling of a relaxed body. The body, when it is relaxed, has a certain delight to it, a kind of beautiful relaxation. 
that is very healthy for you. It allows healing to happen. When the body is nice and relaxed, now we turn to relax our mind, our inner world. We start by coming in to the present moment. And in order to do that, there's a little mental exercise I would ask you to do, if you wish. With your eyes closed, imagine you are holding two heavy suitcases, one in the left hand and one in the right hand, or if you prefer, two heavy shopping bags. And you've been holding those two bags for far too long. And that makes your arms ache and your shoulders hurt. And you imagine that shopping bag in the left hand. On the outside it's got written the four letters P-A-S-T, the past. Because in that shopping bag it represents all those mostly unhappy memories from the past, unfinished business, which you've been carrying around for way too long. And you look in the shopping bag in your right hand, and that has the letters F-U-T-U-R-E on the outside. That represents all your fears and anxieties, your hopes and your dreams, carrying them around way too long. That also makes your right arm ache and your shoulder hurt. Now we imagine just focusing on the shopping bag in your left hand, your past. You cannot throw those memories of the past away yet. But what you can do is lower that shopping bag to the floor. And when it meets the ground, then all the weight, the burden disappears. And it allows you to move your hand away from the handle of the left hand shopping bag and move your arm up to your side so your hand, your arm and your shoulder on the left side can relax fully. And then you imagine the shopping bag in your right hand. You imagine lowering that down to the ground. When that meets the ground, all the weight of the future is taken away. And you can move your right hand right arm up so it too can relax and take in the burden off your right shoulder. And as you are relaxing and resting, which you deserve, you can look at those imaginary shopping bags, one on the left side, one on the right side, and you standing in this wonderful place between them the present moment where you can relax and be at peace. You're not being irresponsible. Those shopping bags, your past and your future, will be available for you to pick up afterwards. You're just having a rest, some freedom, just being in the present moment. How do you feel now? When you come into the present moment, please be kind to it. No need to be afraid. The present moment is a very pleasant place to be in. It gives you a rest. It gives you some freedom. And later on, when you pick up those bags again, your mind will be energized enough to find solutions to some problems which you cannot find by thinking too much. And it's also very pleasant just to be here right now.
And as you come deeper into the present moment, maybe you can experience silence. This is where you don't need to give anything a name. You don't need to try and remember things. You don't need to have a commentary on what's happening. You can be peaceful and silent. And those who have meditated before, often at this point you start to become aware of your breathing. Just to be able to feel the breath as it comes in. Feel the breath as it goes out naturally, not forcing anything. And see if that gentle breathing can replace any thoughts, plans or comments which the mind is making. You can feel and appreciate the value of silently aware, of being aware of, of something as simple as your breathing. It gives you a rest. It gives you a break. It gives you peace of mind. by observing your breath as it comes in and out. And not thinking, not planning, not commenting, just experiencing the peace of silence in this present moment. This is only a short meditation. So just look one more time. How peaceful are you? And number two, how relaxed is your body? Sometimes at the end of even a short meditation, you can taste some beautiful peace, freedom from the thoughts of the past or the future and feel the body relax so well. You feel healthy. So when you are ready, you may open your eyes to finish the meditation. Excellent. <coughs> So for those of you who can see in the front there, the teddy bear, <laughs> this is something which uh, I have used over many years to encourage people to be able to meditate peacefully. Because sometimes that when we do meditate or practice any sorts of spiritual life, a lot of times people are far too aggressive. They want too much and they try too hard. Even just on the train coming up here, one of the people we're sitting next to just happened to be a neighbour from the nuns monastery which I came to visit. And she was a theologian and she was talking about you know, retreats. And I was telling her, it's, you know, it is being quite rebellious that when I teach any meditation retreats, and some of you have been on those retreats, that we call it, wherever we are teaching, if it was in Birmingham when I was teaching a retreat, I would call the retreat Club Med Birmingham. Med is short for meditation. And that's not just a joke, that is something very deep because you're associating the spiritual path with something pleasant and happy. And I do that also because too often, 
too often any spiritual path, any religious path is just too cold and too ascetic. When I was young, growing up in, in West London, you know I used to go to church, in the local, you know I used to go to Anglican church, my dad, you know, your uncle or something, but anyway, and you know, he would never for, uh, forbid me. He said, you going to church, why? I said, no, I just want to go to church. I never told him why. I was only about 10 or 11, and I had a good voice. I was singing in the church choir, and I'd only go for the weddings. And I looked a really cute young boy, and when you went to the weddings, you would sing there, and if you sang really well, the uh, especially the happy couple, they would give you a tip. And I did that especially to look cute. It was what they call these days a good little learner. And my dad never knew anything about that. That was my little secret pocket money. It wasn't the right reason to go to church, but I went there very often, my dad wouldn't forbid me. <laughs> so anyhow, that was when I was very, very young. But sometimes you wonder, why is it that people think that a religious path has to be striving and stressful. And one of the things which, one of the reasons why I went to Thailand to become a monk was that when I went to the different monasteries available in London, honestly I didn't really concern myself too much about the philosophy. What I concerned was concerned about was whether it worked or not. And at that time, it was the Thai monks who were smiling the most. They were the happiest. And I wanted to do something which would increase my sense of peace and happiness, not make me look more miserable. And that was one of the reasons, I'm being honest, why I went to Thailand to become a monk. In those days, People would say it was a land of smiles. Unfortunately, these days, the ability to smile has decreased a lot. But they, got, they have become much more materialistic. The couple of Thai people here, you know that's true. But in the old days, the people were just so easygoing and kind. And that was quite challenging for me. How can, when you have so little of possessions, still be so happy. And honestly, some of the happiest people I've ever seen were the villagers in the northeast, in the Isan. There's two Isan people here, one from the Kompanom, one from Kalasin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you know, when I first went there, some of the people, this was in 1973, no, 74. That's when I ordained as a monk. I've been a monk now 48 years. And they say, when are you going to retire? Retire? Why should you retire when you're having a good time? And anyway, they won't let me retire, will you? <laughs> but anyhow, in that year, when I went over to see you know, Buddhism in action, many of those villagers were so poor, they had no electricity, no um, sealed roads, and the buildings they lived in were just so basic. Under the, the floor was the water buffalo, the kwai, and on the top of the floor was a few uh, rooms, but most of them just lived just on that floor, on the top. I remember being a young monk going into the village to do some ceremony or something in the evening and seeing the whole family, which was about 18 or 19 people, sitting around a little oil lamp. And the oil lamp was just some kerosene in a bowl and they would use the top of the toothpaste tubes and they would push a rag through the hole in the top of the toothpaste tube 
and they'll float it in the kerosene and that will be their light. They're very smoky, but the smoke kept the mosquitoes away. And the light was reflected on the whole family. There's uncles and aunties and grandparents and children and cousins and there's a whole lot of people were in this um, in this uh, building on the top and you could see them every evening no TV, no radio telling stories and jokes I often tell the same jokes as many of you know and sometimes that's being rebellious too you know, why does a monk tell funny stories? and the reason is because there's a meaning behind them but it's also that when you tell a funny story, people pay attention. And it's also, as I said, it's in my blood. I remember your, uh, your nan's brother, my father. He came home one day and he told me that one of his friends had his terrible motorbike accident and lost his leg. No, this was another one, not him. I know about him, yeah. But this was another because this was in London, not in Liverpool where they look after people. In London, they took him to a hospital and unfortunately they, they amputated the wrong leg. So they had to move him back into the surgery and amputate the other leg. He lost both legs. You know what happened afterwards? As soon as he could, he sued the hospital. He lost his case. He didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> That's our family joke, okay? <laughs> That's my dad said that. So I've been totally conditioned by him in the past. But yeah, you groan, but you also, it makes it a little bit more interesting. And that's why you know, even once I became a monk, it was in North East time, I was with an Ajahn Chah and he would tell many funny stories and I never realised a monk could be so funny could have a sense of humour I thought the path towards enlightenment the path of meditation, the path of service was hard work it should be tough and stressful and that was one of the greatest surprises for me. It was very pleasant. And very happy years. Not years which I had to endure, but years which I had to enjoy. There's a different depth of happiness. And if any of you are knowledgeable about how the Buddha actually taught, now he said to everybody, Please be careful of those enjoyments you know, of the five senses, seeing beautiful scenes, beautiful, um, hearing beautiful sounds, smells, tastes and touches, because those can be troublesome. But he said the sixth sense of the mind, the jit, that's tight, the sixth sense, the mind, you don't have to be afraid of the happinesses which come from the mind. And in fact, in one of the suttas, if anybody wants to check me up on this, it's in the Parsadika Sutta. He said, if anybody asks you, monks, do you have a pleasurable life? You should ask him, what type of pleasure do you mean? If it's the pleasure of the senses, five senses, say no. Says the pleasure of the mind, yes. Very much so. And that's why it was so refreshing to see so many happy monks and nuns. Why are they happy? Now I think you've seen me quite a while now. I'm usually a smiley monk. How come? I can't do this and I can't do that. There's so many things which are banned from me. Unfortunately, I, I just, I'll be banned from going to watch a football match at Anfield. They wouldn't allow me, even those time I also went to uh, the Leicester City games. They were in a little room underneath the stands. They couldn't actually see anything. They were just charging and charging and charging. It worked. 
but they couldn't say anything. But there's many things I can't do. How can you be happy when there's so many things you're not allowed to do? I can't even eat in the afternoon or the evening or night time. I can't have any money. There's so many things I don't have. And that does actually mean a challenge for you. You know, one of the things, I told this story, I think one of the first talks I gave here, but recently, as I was getting old, I, actually I'm not getting old anymore, I already am old. <laughs> but as I'm getting old, I decided to apply for an Australian Seniors Healthcare Card. I'm, I'm very healthy. But I thought, why not get one? And you can. So I went on computer, logged in, and applied, and they said, no. We can't give you one. You have to come into the office, because there's a lot of identity fraud these days. I don't know who wanted to impersonate me, but, <laughs> but anyway, they said, you have to come in. So I went into the, the local, like, I don't know whether they call it in the UK, over in uh, Australia, it's called like Centrelink. The Department of Social Security, what do they call it? Anyway, whatever they call it. I went in there and they said, they sat me down in front of one of their officers. Um, excuse me, but you have to prove who you are. And anyone who knows Buddhism will know that that's a very deep question. <laughs> So I said, I've been trying to find the answer to that for the last 50 years. <laughs> and you know, people who work for the government haven't got a sense of humour. <laughs> she said, look, I'm serious. <laughs> Show me some identity um, documents. Show me your driver's licence. Monks don't have driver's licences. Show me your credit card. I don't have a credit card. Show me your bank account details. I don't have a bank account. I actually have got zero cash. I don't have any money, honestly. And so show me, even actually to get here, uh, it was our secretary, Ali, who actually bought the train tickets, and somebody else actually paid for the taxi to get here. Uh, that was to the station over in um, Oxford, and then somebody picked us up from here. So if they disappeared, we'd be stuck here. I've got no money. You know, it's wonderful, you don't need any money, because what you do have is lots of friends who care for you. That's why I never have to worry about anything. But anyway, said, I've got no bank account here. So what about your, your rental agreement, the place you live? I don't rent. Oh, you own. Show us your ownership of your, your house. I don't own a house. I actually live in a cave in Australia. That's true, you know, you've been there. And so, I don't have anything. And next they said, we don't have a credit card, you don't have a bank account, you don't own anything. Show us your marriage license. <laughs> I'm a monk, I don't get married. But honestly, as I was coming here this time, that you know, going through the immigration and customs, they said, sir, have you got anything in your bag? I said, no, no, I've got nothing in my bag. You got any, like, hair gel? <laughs> I said, look, I'm a mug. Fortunately, he laughed, I laughed, and so they let me through. I'll tell you another funny story. When I was in the United States, I went through the customs there. They said, sir, what have you got underneath your robe? Is it a suicide belt? I said, no, no, it's fat. <laughs> and the guy said, same thing. <laughs> but you know, it's not suicide belt, it's not fat. The reason why, as a monk, you get what we call gravitas, <laughs> it's not fat, it's that I've been a monk 48 years now. And after 48 years, every year your heart grows a bit bigger. Out of kindness, compassion. 
Many years ago, my heart grew so big, it was pressing against my ribcage. And it only had one other way to go, it went down and out. This is not fat, this is a big heart. <laughs> That's my excuse. Anyway, so, I said, I didn't have any of these documents to prove who I was. So they came up to me and said, you don't exist. I said, wow, the Buddha was correct. <laughs> you know, and she got so fed up with me. She said, I did have a passport, I've got two passports, English, British and Australian. I'm not supposed to use both passports to prove who you are. But she said, yeah, okay, I think you are who you are. She ticked the boxes and got rid of me. I think she was getting fed up. That's another way to deal with uh, government workers. Tell the truth, to make them so difficult that they want to get rid of you straight away. <laughs> so anyhow, does anybody here work for the government? <laughs> oh my goodness. I better not ask you. Okay, very good, I won't ask. But anyhow, it was a, just talking about the government, this is the rebellious nature of Buddhism. First of all, you don't fit in. You don't have to fit in. You can just you know, challenge what your mother and father want for you. you know, my father, this is an interesting story, that you know in our family, our, our family were very poor. And you know, we looked after each other though, very friendly. And, but then, uh, when I, I went to the Audrey Primary School, now from the primary school, we got this scholarship to this, you know, posh, it was a direct grad school in Hammersmith. And only one kid from my school went there. And then afterwards, it was actually the same place where Hugh Grant and I think Dr. Snape, what was his name? They, he went there as well. They were just students later on. So it was a very posh college. But, you know, from there, I started doing well especially in maths. I was really good at maths. That's one of the reasons why I ask people a little maths question. See if you're good at maths. 26 sheep in a field. 10 die. How many survive? 16? No, that's wrong. Listen carefully. That's a problem with people. They don't listen. I say it slowly. Twenty sick sheep <laughs> and ten die. They were sick, that's why they die. So anyway. So I doing the maths at school was really easy because you can either do it or you can't, and that's about it. So I did started doing really well. And that's when my teacher, I think I was only about thirteen or fourteen at the time. They had the parents' teacher night. And so I never knew what happened. But my teacher at that time, you know, he was in the British Army during the Second World War. He was a tank captain. This was my school teacher. And his tank got blown up during that war. And the Italian doctors you know, looked after him, saved his life. But because he was blown up, his face was all disfigured and had you know, scars all over the place. You know, to a young, was it 12 or 13 year old, he looked like a monster. And he was your teacher. So you're really scared of him. And then at the parents' teacher's night, I was doing so well, that he actually told my father, you know, Bill, he told my father, so your son's doing really well, he might go to university, even Cambridge. And that's when my father, almost had a fight with my teacher because it was taking me away from the family. It was distancing me from him. And that was a really big difficulty for him. If I wanted to become a, a bartender or own a pub, oh, he would all love that. <laughs> but, you know, eventually he came round, but that my father loved the child so much 
that didn't want anything to separate him from his children. That was something which I admired in my dad. But what happened when I was 16, that's when uh, Bill, my father, died. So he had no say in me going to university. But I remember when I got my scholarship to go to Cambridge. That's when I remember my mother calling up Dicky. We were talking about him earlier, that's my uncle. And Dicky just burst out crying. He was so happy that one of his family was doing well at school. And you now you know him, so that's why I mentioned that for you. But that was a challenge. It hadn't been done before. Why on earth you have that really great education? And why just go off to Thailand to become a monk? And of course, what that's actually doing, it was an act of rebellion. I was rebelling what other people wanted me to do. And doing what he kind of felt was more important. At that time, people were saying that just, you know, education is fantastic. There are many types of education. And one of the reasons why I decided to rebel was as well as you know, going to a great university, I had friends from different religions and one of those friends was quite a devout Christian. And he said that with his friends, he was going to this full-born hospital which dealt with people with mental impairments. And sometimes even some students out of stress would become suicidal and that's the place they would go as well. And my Christian friend said he was volunteering to go there once a week to do some social service. At that time I was not interested in social service at all. I was very busy. But, because a Christian friend was doing this and I was a Buddhist, I thought, okay, I'm going to go as well. I would not be outdone by my Christian friends. And that was the only reason I went. And those Christian friends only lasted a couple of weeks. But I kept on going there for two years. And the reason I did that, because I enjoyed it so much, it was doing some uh, occupational therapy with Down Syndrome people. I'd always thought the Down Syndrome people were, should be put aside somewhere and not seen. And that's what they were doing in those days, putting them in, insti in an institution. But, Having got to know them, and honestly getting to love them and respect them, they showed so much what these days we call emotional intelligence. I had the intellectual intelligence, could pass exams, but the emotional intelligence was far more valued by me anyway. I often tell this example that I went there one, I think it was a Thursday afternoon got off the bus, started walking in the institution, and this guy saw me, one of the Down Syndrome people, and they came running towards me. And as soon as they ran towards me, they put their arms around me and gave me this beautiful hug. And they asked me, what's wrong? They asked me what's wrong. Because they could see from my face something had happened and I wasn't my usual happy self. I don't know how they would know this. It was the night before I broke up with a girlfriend. I wasn't always a monk. <laughs> and they picked it up straight away. That just blew my mind. They were just so sensitive. And I respected them so much from that time. And I learned so much about how to relate to another human being. Not just with theory was something which was much deeper, which challenged the theory which you felt. And often that's the case. Sometimes I have to you know, give short talks or pithy talks, and one of the things which I've often said, and this was actually when I gave uh, some talks to some people in the British Army. There were Buddhists, there were soldiers, 
And I thought, to be a Buddhist and be in the army, you must be in some sort of support staff. You know, like the dentist. Or there was one monk, he used to be a Gurkha. And I thought, that's really scary, being a Gurkha, because the saying about the Gurkhas, which you know the Gurkhas have been, when you wake up in the morning, you shake your head and it falls off. They're very violent. And I thought, can we have this person in our monastery? He said, yeah, he was a Gurkha, but he was working in the, in the pay office. <laughs> Just working out people's salaries. Very nice fellow. But anyway, these uh, English um, soldiers, I thought there might be support staff. They weren't. These were frontline soldiers fighting in Iraq at the time. And that really shocked me. How can you be a Buddhist and be a soldier at the same time? Well, one thing which I've always done is to judge at the very end, if you're going to judge at all, but listen first of all. It's one of the sayings, never allow the, your learning to stand in the way of truth. Learning is one thing. The truth is what you experience directly. And that's much more accurate. I had learnt a lot, but knew so little. Experience taught me much more. And that was one of the greatest uh, rebellions of Buddhism. To put aside what other people say. Put aside you know, what even the culture says. Have a powerful mind a fair mind, free of uh, desire and ill will, and see what's actually happening. Many times we suffer simply because we're following what's supposed to happen rather than seeing what's really there. And a good example of that, I'm just putting uh, a bit of dangerous, but it's not like challenging, even your health. Are you healthy? Do sometimes you get afraid of cancer? I've done a huge amount of work with people suffering from cancer over in Perth, Western Australia. So much so that when the community over there uh, got a government grant to build a multi-million dollar facility, that they invited two people to open that facility. One was the, the Premier of Western Australia, the head politician, and the other one was me. And I was so honoured and surprised. Why me? And they said, because you've done such amazing work to support people with cancer. So we want you to also be in this opening ceremony. And I still go there every year. Twice. And anyway, they respect his Buddhist teachings so much. Why? This is just one example, because sometimes you have these examples of people who are meditating, who have cancer, big time. There's one story, there was this gentleman who was on one of my retreats, he wasn't a Buddhist, but he had a big tumour in his sinus so bad that he couldn't breathe through his nose. So during the first day of this meditation retreat, Club Med Sydney at that time, the first day of the retreat, I had all these complaints from the other people meditating. Can you please ask everybody to breathe quietly? Because this man was breathing so loud. <laughs> through his mouth. And then I told everybody on the retreat, I apologise, I should have mentioned this earlier, but that gentleman has got this huge tumour in his sinuses. His doctors have given up on him. There's nothing more to do except just to prepare for death. And so he came there, just as a last roll of the dice, as he told me. What happened to him was after nine days, 
nothing worked. He was still breathing loudly. But the last, last meditation he did, the last meditation just before the retreat ended, he heard a popping sound. That's how he described it. I remember his words. I heard a popping sound and I could breathe through my nose again the first time in months. But only for one minute, then the tumour closed up again. It gave him so much confidence. It was the last meditation of the retreat. I had to uh, leave the retreat and just come back from Sydney to Perth. And so I just said, told him just to carry on. And six months later, when I was in Sydney again, giving a talk in another, uh, another place, this guy came up to me, and please don't do this to me. He said, do you remember me? <laughs> I've got a little trick which I do. He said, yes, I remember you. You're the man whose name I keep forgetting. <laughs> That's just an old trick. But anyway, I said, no, I was honest, I don't remember you, who are you? And then he announced himself, he was that man who was dying of a sinus cancer. Of course you don't remember them. When people are sick and close to death, they look a totally different way. When they're healthy, they fill out, they look, you know, just the healthy look. I said, I was that man. I carried on what you were teaching me. And the cancer is now in full remission. Thank you. And he said that he's spending the rest of his life, however many years he's got left, just teaching that meditation for others. That, that is rebellious. That's not supposed to happen. But that's one case out of many, many, many. You've got to trust your doctors up to a point. But sometimes, all this other stuff which happens, why do we think this cannot happen, it cannot occur, when it does? So this is one of the reasons why I love that idea of, you know, even in those days, the Buddha being rebellious. There's other ways of treating disease, even from those earlier times. The attitude of your mind. How are you dealing you know, with what's happening? Number one, is there anybody in this room, be honest, who's never been sick? Can I assume you've all been sick from time to time? If there was something, someone in this room who's never been sick, that would be really weird. There'd be something wrong with you. So being sick is normal. So why on earth, that when you are sick, do you go to your doctor, you know, maybe your GP, why do you tell your doctor, there's something wrong with me, doctor. I'm sick. Please never say that. Be rebellious. Say, doctor, there's something right with me. I'm sick again. Don't give sickness a bad name. It's nature's way of healing you, of telling you you're just going too far in one direction. Now one of the other things which uh, we rebel against. I don't know if you realize this, that the particular type of Buddhism which we practice here, Theravada Buddhism, is the oldest continuous democratic tradition in our world. For 2,500 years and a bit more, every monastery has no hierarchy. In Thailand, there is a hierarchy. And, you know, there's Sangharajas, and there is um, Chao Kuns. You know, I'm a Chao Kun. Chao Kun. Chao Kun, that's given by the king, a title, yeah. Yeah, that's my name, Chao Kun. Uh, oh, <laughs> Yeah, Chao Kung Wisu Di Sangwa La Terra. That's my official title. But I never, sorry? 
เงียบเงียบชาวคนเออไม่ใช่ดิสไอคิดถึงเงียบเพราะฉะนั้นไม่ใช้ใช้ไอจีนบราวน์เพราะฉะนั้นบางทีคุณจะรีบเบลเกี่ยวกับแบบชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่มีชื่อที่We have to make it uh, in a democratic vote. And if one monk objects, we can't go through with that. It has to be unanimous decision all the time. That's what we do. And there's no hierarchy outside our monastery can tell us what to do. That's the original way the Buddhist monasteries were run. Unfortunately, those are lost in many monasteries these days. But because I'm a scouser, because I'm rebellious, because you know you want to actually be uh, more respectful you know, to how the Buddha taught, we make sure we follow those rules. Many times I get outvoted, and I'm proud of that because it means that whoever uh, that are. Monastery is following a very early tradition. So one of the things which we did, which was quite rebellious, one of the reasons why Venerable Chanda chose the title of this talk, was that 13 years ago, there were four ladies in Western Australia who asked me if they could have the full ordination as what we call a bikuni. The full monastic ordination for women, and I know my uh, vinaya. That's the monastic teachings. I've taught many people Pali, and I was for a time the expert in vinaya, the monks' discipline, uh, for our Western tradition, and I knew it was possible. And so, when four people asked me, why not? So we did it. The democratic uh, agreement amongst our monks over in Australia, and of course, that is when they say in in English, that's when the SHIT hit the fan. Because my problem was, I was a Chow Kun. And I knew what I was doing, and I knew you had the legitimacy for it. And it was also the equity: how can you treat half of our population as not equal or deserving of the same which the Buddha allowed? Thing is, thing of the problem with me: I knew my stuff. And one of the things, if you ever read. The story of the Buddha. After his enlightenment, he made a vow. His vow was that he wouldn't leave this world until he had established a strong, flourishing, uh, monastic group of men. Number two, until he had established a strong, flourishing. Monastic group of women, until he established a strong, flourishing uh, lay men's group, until he established a long uh, and established for female lay group. They call the four pillars of Buddhism. Right from the very beginning, the Buddha ordained women. As bikunis, fully ordained nuns, and there were some fantastic women in those days. Now, for example, like in the room where I was staying in, there was a statue of Patachara, an incredible lady who'd lost her husband, her children, and her parents on the same day, and she went crazy. 
And when she was crazy, she was wandering. Imagine, you, it's your whole family. Your parents, your two children, and your husband. And so she was wandering around, just crazy. When she came into where the Buddha was giving a sermon, she had no clothes on at all. If somebody came in this hall, a woman, young, naked, what would you do? Would you chase her out? People tried to, but the Buddha said, no, let her in. One of the other monks gave her a, a robe to put around her, and she became ordained as a bhikkhuni, and became this incredible, powerful meditator, and totally enlightened. And I remember her because many times there were bhikkhunis, women who'd been meditating for years, getting nowhere, and then they said, this one nun came up, and once she started teaching, they got the full enlightenment. She had this incredible power. You know why? Because of all the suffering she had. I've often told the story, and you've heard, many of you have heard this before. What do you do if you tread into the dog shit? If you get it all over your shoes, what do you do? Never scrape it off. Take it home and dig it in, in your garden. You get these beautiful apples. I usually tell this in, in places like Australia, we've got delicious mangoes now. Dig it under your mango tree. And the more dog shit you dig in under your mango tree, the more delicious, sweet and juicy are your mangoes. They're like nobody else's mangoes. So all the difficulties of life, you turn them into wisdom and kindness. And that's what this nun did, Patachara. And she became just basically one of my heroes. And that was because the Buddha was rebellious enough to give full ordination, and no one else was doing that, to women. Why not? So anyway, it's not just to women, but I'm rebellious enough I've given ordination to many gay people. You wouldn't know who they are because once you know you are fully ordained, you know, you're just like everybody else. You teach, you restrain to people with schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, how can you deal with schizophrenia? You may know someone with schizophrenia. It's a very difficult condition to deal with. But when this one young man came, and he was a clinical schizophrenic and on a dosage of clozapine. And then when he asked to become a monk, why not? And he was so mindful and kind and honest with himself. I remember him coming to me when he was just starting his training, telling me that the dosage is wrong. He was losing it. Can he go into hospital? So we took him into the hospital, he stayed there for a few days, adjusted his dosage and came back again. When somebody knows what's going on like that, you tend to trust them. Now he is a senior monk, and he's just one of my, I can't say achievements, he's like one of my proudest kids, if you like, because sometimes being a senior monk, these are like your, your children. Brilliant, sensitive man. So all the time, when somebody says, no, you shouldn't do that, we rebel. Why not? And then you do break new ground and give opportunities for so many other people. How the Buddha taught that if it's going to inspire people, then why not do it? To give this Buddhism, this practice, a little bit more freedom to actually to grow into our modern world. Still keeping the simplicity, not having any money, just uh, living a, a peaceful lifestyle. That is so important. You never let that go. 
the number of people we can allow in to practice keeps on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Right now, just even on the train, coming up here, we're talking about transgender people. Why can't we not allow them in as well? So we're doing it. Why not? That to me is being rebellious, not just rebelling just for the sake of rebelling, but rebelling to try and improve things for all beings. And when we can do that, then you get so much happiness being a leader. I don't know, even some people here, they come up to me and say, oh, it's so wonderful to see you. They know me very well, they see me on YouTube so many times. I remember even just, not this time, when I was going through Paddington Station and this um, Afro-English lady ran up to me, remember that, and she said to me, are you the YouTube monk? <laughs> and she looked at me, yeah, you are! And she said that I'd saved her life. What do you mean? She said because she was going through a separation with her long-time partner. The doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, friends couldn't help her. So she was getting desperate. So she went on YouTube and she clicked into one of my talks. She said she, she listened about three or four talks in a row, you know, an hour long each. She said that did the trick for her. And of course she was just so bamboozled, confounded, discombobulated, <laughs> whatever you wish to call it, that you know, the, the YouTube mic was in Paddington Station. So that gave me a great deal of uh, workplace fulfilment. These things are actually working. Because you are rebelling, you can connect with people. You're not just following old traditions which are past their use by dates. You're actually doing something which is worthwhile. So that's actually what we're up to. The Chao Kun, I don't really tell people about that these days. But I do tell them, was it a year ago, two years ago, we got what's you know, called the Order of Australia medal. That's like an OBE. What was it for? For services to gender equity. When they first wanted to give like those awards, you think, oh no, I don't need those. When they said what it's for, yes. <laughs> So those are the sorts of things what happen when you challenge and you rebel and to make the world a much better place. There are better ways of doing things. Even for those of you who are married, do you argue? Tippy, does he argue with you? Honest? <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> yeah. Why? There were these two people who'd been married for a while and they were walking through the forest one evening, or they, you know, the park. And as they were walking through the park, they heard this sound. Quack, quack. Quack, quack. And straight away, she said, oh, can you hear that? That's a chicken. And he said, no, it's not a chicken, it's a duck. And she said, no, no, I'm sure, it's a chicken. She said, it can't be, it's a duck. They went quack, quack again, it's a duck, see? And the wife said, no, I'm sure, it's a chicken. And he said, it's a duck, D-U-C-K, duck. And then she started to get teary. I'm sure, it's a chicken. <laughs> and then he had this moment of great wisdom. He thought, why is she my wife? Is being right important or being in love more important? Which one is more important? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got it. 
So he squeezed her hand gently, looked into her eyes and said, Darling, I think you may be right. That is a chicken. They went quack quack again. And she said, thank you. <laughs> and they <laughs> continued their walk in love and he got a hot dinner that night. <laughs> so the moral of that story is, who cares whether it's a chicken or a duck? Is that important? Of course it's not important. So why argue? Most people argue about the small things, which are unimportant. If that doesn't work, in a marriage there's always another way of settling differences. We call that the calendar method. If you're having an argument, doesn't matter how much you research, doesn't matter if you're an intellectual genius, you will never convince your wife that she's wrong. You can't convince him that he's wrong. You can't do that. It's impossible. So what you do is you look at the, the date of the month. What date of the month is it today? 22nd? 22nd today. Okay, if it's an even day, of the month, 2nd, 4th, 6th, 8th, 10th, 12th, etc. Then he's right. <laughs> so today your husband's right, okay? But if it's an odd day of the month, then she is right. That way it's fair. <laughs> that was, and actually she gets more days of the year which are right than you do. But it's worth it for peace of mind. <laughs> That was working so well, except when, yeah, okay, except when we started to have same-sex marriage. <laughs> now you're both wrong on the same day, <laughs> and you're both right on the same day. Okay, so that's being a bit rebellious, challenging, but it works. Give it a try. Okay, now there's supposed to be questions, answers and complaints. The three C's. We're so early, are we? Oh, we've got half an hour. Then we've got to go because I've got to catch a train. Okay, who's going to ask the first question? Okay, if I'm not going to get a question, I'm going to tell a little story about questions. There was... Somebody actually came to see the Buddha and they asked about the law of karma, reincarnation, all that sort of stuff. Why is it that some people are wealthy and other people are poor? Doesn't matter how hard you work, sometimes it never goes right in your business. You work really hard, you save, you try, but you always find it difficult to you know, meet all the expenses. So what karma do you have to do in this life to be rich in your next life. And the Buddha said, it's, you know, if you know how to use your money wisely, you know, look after yourself and your family, but also to give donations to charities which are in need, look after your friends who are in need. If you practice generosity, then it's like the next life, somehow or other you'll get more money, you know, because now they think you can make use of the money wisely. They said generosity was the reason. The next question they asked the Buddha was, why are some people beautiful and other people ugly? It doesn't matter if you go for facelifts, go to a spa, do a new hairstyle, you're still ugly. <laughs> what karma did you do in the past to be ugly in this life? Or what do you have to do in this life to be beautiful in your next? Now you may notice that when I said this story, I wasn't keeping any eye contact. <laughs> and the reason was, this is true, in Singapore when I first said that story, I just happened to be looking at one lady when I mentioned the word ugly, and she really complained. Why did you say ugly when you're looking at me? <laughs> so anyway, interestingly, the cause for beauty in your next life, and even some of this life, is being kind and virtuous, being a good person. I sometimes wonder why so many people take photographs of me, 
when I'm old and fat. Why? There's some sort of kindness or virtue, trustworthiness there. So anyhow, the main part of the story was they asked the Buddha, why are some people intelligent and other people they find it so hard you know, to pass exams at school or university, they never even get close to university, why? You may have some of your kids in university. Are they struggling? Are they doing well? What karmic cause is there to be intelligent in your next life? And the Buddha said, the reason why you will be intelligent in your next life is if you ask questions in this life. That's true, that's what he said. So, any questions? <laughs> Oh, there are going to be a lot of stupid people in Birmingham next time. <laughs> Come and ask a question. Can't wait to complain. Uh, okay, they're already intelligent. That's annoying. Yeah? Um, do you have any advice on how to deal with um, sleepiness? Yes, how to deal with sleepiness. Go to bed. <laughs> now, that's not a joke simply because most people are sleep deprived. You, you've lost the art of going to sleep easily and staying asleep. We wake up too early sometimes. And sometimes when we go to sleep we're not really sleeping. We're thinking and worrying. One of the reasons why... Look, there was this psychologist who I met in Sydney She'd started a company, an online company, and it was called sleeplikeababy.com. It was many years ago. You know what she was doing? Exactly the same as I taught you in that guided meditation at the beginning. And because she was a psychologist, she was charging people for it. She was making a fortune. As for Buddhist monks and nuns, we do it for free. But just because we do it for free doesn't mean it's not valuable. That did happen to me, I'm not making this up. Someone called me, are you teaching meditation tonight? Yes. How much do you charge? Nothing. Well, you can't be any good then. She hung up the phone. <laughs> just because you don't charge, it doesn't affect the value of what you're doing. So all these things which are put online for free, they're very powerful. So just when you go to bed tonight, just try something simple like those two suitcases or shopping bags simile. Before you go into bed, you don't take shopping bags into bed with you. The past, put it on one side of the bed. The future on the other side of the bed. You can pick them up in the morning. But you don't worry about them when you're sleeping. It's something as simple as that. But often I've noticed that there's tension in your body, the unresolved tightnesses or sicknesses somewhere. But just doing the sweeping of the body and learning how to relax your whole body. That was a wonderful way of falling asleep. You don't need to count sheep because that makes you even more sort of tense. Instead just relax the whole of your body so you're very comfortable when you're in that bed. And then, usually you don't even get much far up, your body already pretty relaxed when you just get you know, past your legs. And you fall fast asleep. No worries at all. I often think if more people would sleep deeply, and have regular good sleeps, there'd be far less cancers, divorces, arguments in our world. We forgot how to sleep, which is a great shame. Have you ever seen babies? You put them to bed. I remember, this was actually not my father's side of the family, my mother's side of the family, they were over in Stoke-on-Trent. 
And then I remember they took me to some Christmas celebration, apparently. I don't remember anything of it. I was only a baby. There was no place for me to sleep in. So they put me in a drawer in one of the cupboards. It was just, just my fat in there, apparently, quite well. They closed the door. And I was very happy all night. So they say, I think these days I can probably sue them for child abuse. <laughs> of course, I would never do that. But a baby can sleep so, so easily, wherever they are. Why? And one of the things which I was always really impressed with, these days I don't go into shopping centres unless to bless something or do something you can't do elsewhere. But I've seen people in crowded shopping centres and the mother is carrying their baby. And that baby goes fast asleep. If somebody was carrying me in a shopping centre, there's no way I could go to sleep. I'd be terrified you'd drop me or you hit something. But the child trusts their mother so much they can relax to the max and go fast asleep. Wonderful to see. If you can trust now your bed, your house, you feel safe. That's another way of finding a very deep, beautiful sleep. Okay, yes, another intelligent person in Birmingham next year. Next life, yeah? How you find peace? You already have peace, you don't have to find it. And you look upon that not in changing the situation in which you live, but changing the way you regard it and react to it. A good example of that is for a long time I would teach in prisons. And the prisoners were in this you know, terrible situation in jail. They lost all of their self-respect. Having to wear, in Australia, it was like green uh, clothes all the time. And then, whenever I went into jail, it was amazing. I would, I would never see a criminal inside jail. In all those years I went into jail to teach, I never saw a thief, never saw a murderer, never saw a rapist, never saw a fraudster. I never saw any of those. All I ever saw was a person who'd raped a person who'd stolen, a person who had um, murdered. They were much bigger than that. And much more than that. Why define a person for one, two, three, four stupid things they've done in their life? And when you get to know those prisoners, you ask them why they did that. Now you find out that they're either just drunk or on drugs, or just peer pressure. Well, you know, one of those stories, I remember this because when I was signing those books, there were some books which had been translated into German. The Open the Door of Your Heart story was translated in, into the German edition of De Coup de Vainty, The Cow That Cried. And that was a real story. One of the prisoners who came to see me once this really big guy, and you could tell straight away, and he confessed it, he was Northern Irish. And this was a time, you know, in Northern Ireland, there was huge amounts of violence. And you could see he had so many scars on him, but a very big, tough guy. And he said that he was born in Belfast, and he said he first got stabbed when he was six years of age, in school. And he kept on swearing when he was telling the story. He said, it's God's own effing truth, he said to me. And he said, I went to school and the bully asked for my dinner money. I said, no. And the bully got out a knife. He didn't ask me again, he just stabbed me in the arm. And all this blood was coming out of his arm. He ran home to his house just around the corner from the school, father unemployed. Daddy, Daddy, I've been stabbed. There's blood everywhere. 
And what his father did, he said, it's God's own effing truth again. He said, my father just took me to the kitchen. He took a knife out of the drawer, gave it to me and told me to go and stab that boy back. He said, that, honestly, that's how he was brought up. And he told me that he had killed people before, but he wasn't in jail for murder, for something else. A very scary man. But at this prison farm, they were trying to train the prisoners there for a job when they got released. And so it was a farm. And in that farm, they didn't just grow carrots. They had sheep and cows. And whenever anybody in that uh, government system needed some more meat for their uh, prisons, they would get it from this prison farm. And so that many of those prisoners were working in the, the abattoir, you know, where they would kill the sheep and cut them up. And he said he was the head executioner there. He said he had to fight for that job, just messing around in blood all day. But then he said that the last week when he came to see me, that something happened he had to tell somebody about. There were slaughtering cows. And they, he described the way into the, the place where they were slaughtered. These two very, very strong stainless steel bars wide at the entrance and narrowing down as you proceeded. And that's how they would force the cows or the sheep or the pigs, whatever it was, actually to come in one by one, eventually many at the start, but then forcing one by one. And he would stand on an elevated platform with the electric gun. And he'd always say it'd be one shot to stun, the second shot to kill. This is what he'd been doing every day for months. I don't know why people think that's going to be therapeutic to people who are just so rough and violent they're in there for such terrible crimes. It's basically doing much of the same as they did when they were free. And he said that all the animals who would come in, they would know what was going to happen to them. And they would make this certain sounds he knew the, the, crowd, the, the sound of the cows moaning. They were about to be killed. They could see the cows in front of them being killed. They could smell it. But then he said, this one ordinary morning, killing cows, this one cow came into the space below him. And this cow was not making any noise at all and walked in, like slowly, deliberately, not being pushed by others. It walked in, like voluntarily, stood where it was supposed to stand, and then looked up at this Irish man. He said he'd never seen anything like this before. He just froze for a minute. And as he was uh, frozen, the cow was keeping eye contact with his eyes. He noticed something really weird. First time he'd ever seen this. It says, in the left eye, now the cows have huge eyes, above the lower lid, there was water welling up. And soon that water got so much that the eyelid couldn't hold it any longer. It dripped down the cow's cheek. That really threw him. But he was still looking at the cow when the same happened in the right eye. Tears were welling up and then a tear rolled down the right cheek. And they said at that, he just threw down the gun. He said the prison officers could do whatever they want with him, but that cow is not dying. That was the cow that cried. When he came up to me, he said, I'm a vegetarian now, I'm a vegetarian now. And you see how many scars this man had over his face. And he admitted killing human beings. I don't know what else he did to them. But that crying cow, 
changed his whole life. It's one of the reasons why even somebody like that can find peace. He got that peace from a cow. So many opportunities we have for this. I just remember that because I saw the, the title in the book, The Coup de Vainty, German for the Cow that Cried. Oh yeah, yes. Sorry? For alcohol? Yeah. Well, I don't know, but uh, when I was over in, especially Singapore and Thailand and other countries, the people were very afraid you know, of ghosts. You know, the Thai people are terrified of ghosts. Have you ever seen pee? Yeah. You have seen the pee? Excellent. Pee, yeah. No, you haven't. Okay. P is the word for a ghost. So that when I was in Thailand, we were all warned about a particular type of ghost which exists, which is very, very, very dangerous. I've actually seen this one myself. And it just possesses people. And it's even been the cause of many people actually to die or get terribly injured. And it's called Hinaikuat, the bottle ghost. It lives in bottles of alcohol, of <laughs> vodka, and whiskey, and rum, which is one of the. And you open those bottles, and it possesses you. And if you're driving, you can lose your license, you can even sort of kill yourself and others. That's why they call those things spirits. <laughs> so that's the most dangerous ghost of all. Number two, other uh, alcohol. I mentioned to you that I went to this really so-called great university in Cambridge. Because I was a scholar, the once a year you had the scholars' dinner there's only about maybe 5% of the students were scholars. And we had this dinner together with the, all these Nobel laureates and dons and stuff, the lecturers. And I couldn't believe it. It was a nine course meal served by butlers. Never had any butlers in Liverpool, or my father never had any butlers. <laughs> it was weird. And every Oh, I, should, I should actually start properly. We started off with um, sherry, served again by butlers, the full works, in the, the gallery built by Sir Christopher Wren in this college. And because I was studying maths with another, one of my other friends, we noticed that the butlers were going around this huge table in an anti-clockwise direction. So we worked out if we went at the same speed in a clockwise direction, we'd receive twice as much sherry as everybody else. <laughs> That's how stupid you were when you were young. And then after so much sherry, the nine course meal, every uh, meal had a different type of wine with it. And so after that, we went to the old library where we had big glasses, one for claret, one for Madeira, and one for port. And if that wasn't enough, that it was a college tradition, had this big uh, goblet, which was filled, I by this time I don't know which, which uh, spirit or wine it was filled with, but everyone, you know, from the the master of the college, he was a Nobel laureate, so even little students like me, we had to drain that goblet, you know, an amazing amount of port or something, lift it up and drink it all down, and then say a toast in Latin. That was the college tradition. At that time, I was obedient and I did that. I still don't remember how I got back to my room. 
But when I did, I woke up in the morning with a big pile of vomit next to me. Now that is really dangerous, you could die very easily there. But it really told me, what am I doing this for? That was food, which was you know, some of the most best food, delicious food, made by some of these chefs who are you know, one, some of the top in the world. And I'd vomited it all out. When people said, what a beautiful day that was. I had such a bad hangover. How can you say that was fun? And that was the last time I took alcohol. I was a student at that time. And I thought that was a big sacrifice. But then, I still got invited to as many parties. In fact, I was even more popular with my friends. And the reason was because they always wanted somebody sober to drive them home. That's my job. <laughs> that is actually, to this day, I can't see why we took alcohol. Even again, being honest, I never told my dad this. I had my first half a pint of beer when I was 14. It was illegal. When I drank it, now honestly, it didn't taste nice at all. It really tasted terrible, my first half pint. But then after a while, you got a taste for it. You got a taste for it, you started to like it because you had to. The peer pressure was so strong. But you know, if you have uh, an addiction to it or you take too much of it now, it's not that hard to say no. The first thing to make sure it's distant from you. In other words, it's not just in the, in the cupboard somewhere. If you do want to get some, you have to really go outside of the house. It's not convenient. Because when it takes time for you to get that alcohol and drink it, every moment you have to wait before you make that decision and then you take it. Every moment you have the opportunity to say no and not do it again. It is bad for your health. It isn't a bad if you're driving. Even small amounts of alcohol do affect your awareness. And do you want to be a person like that? So after a while, basically you give it up. You can ask your kids, especially if you've got young kids. I remember just uh, talking to one kid at about 11 or 12. And they say, you know, what do you think about alcohol? He said, no, it's terrible. We said, you know, people get drunk when they have alcohol. And then we say, have you seen anyone drunk? And then the kid turned around to his father, yeah, him. <laughs> really embarrassed the father. But good on that kid. You know that uh, our you know, your nanny's uh, father, no, my father's father, you know, in Liverpool, that I often ask my dad, you know, what happened to my granddad, my paternal father? You never talk about him. And it took me a long time to get the information out of my father, Bill, about what, what my father was like, my grandfather was like. And then one day, he just opened up he said, your paternal grandfather, please excuse me, this is what my father said, your paternal grandfather was a bastard. He said it was just such pain. But why? What did he do? And he said, he was a plumber. And he said every evening, when he came home from work, he was always by the pub, and he'd come home drunk every evening. And then once he was drunk, he'd take off his belt, and he'd whip anyone who was in his path. For no reason. Sometimes my father got a belting for nothing. But he said what really upset him was that uh, his father, my paternal grandfather, would start beating up his wife, dad's mum. And he said that was much more painful because he could not protect his own mother from his dad. 
is the drunkenness. And because of that, one thing my father also told me, that was why I could never spank him. Sometimes my brother and I deserved, you know, the spanking we were messing around. He would come into our bedroom with a slipper. He could never use it. Because he had those very bad memories from the past, from his own father. So, I mean, that's what alcohol does. It's not worth it. Even my father used to like a drink. But, you know, he was never violent at all. Anyway, does that help at all? Is that answering the question or just going around in circles? Okay, good. Yeah? What do you feel bad? Does it make sense to take action or do things in order to regulate your emotions or do you just feel them or do they go away? To regulate your emotions, yeah. first of all you have to get to know them. Or where they come from. Because you know, there are good emotions, there are bad emotions, and sometimes if you try to regulate, stop even bad emotions, they get worse. This is one of the reasons why they say someone is violent. You're trying to stop that violence, regulate it. Why are you violent? What's upsetting you so much? Sometimes it's just a conditioning because maybe our parents or people who influence us were violent, that we think we should do that as well. Be rebellious. Is that the best way? It's one of the nice things about Buddhism, you know, Buddhists aren't violent. We don't ever hit anybody or hurt anybody. And it's been amazing in my life. Sometimes I should have been punched or hit. And as a monk, but somehow or other, people just can't do that. I was mentioning to Venerable Chanda that many years ago, when I was visiting my mother, you know, Bill's wife, Hazel, that's my mum, uh, she was living in a council flat in Acton, and there was a Sri Lankan temple close by. And I would usually walk over there to give a talk. And one evening when I was walking to the Sri Lankan temple, I walked just a different way this day, and it was past this housing estate in South Acton, which was one of these so-called very rough areas, like a hotbed of crime. And as I was walking past, it was the evening, and there was already a group of young people that were congregating there, and nothing else to do in the evening like a gang. And as this gang saw me in my robes, they started chanting, Buddha, 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 getting louder as I was getting closer, trying to intimidate me. Buddha, 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 Buddha. And then, I don't know why, maybe I'm a bit crazy, but I decided I'm not going to turn to the other side of this uh, street. I'm not going to make a U-turn. I'm going to carry on. And as I get closer and closer, Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. And then, this was maybe about 15 or 20 years ago, then with my arms, hands, I'll just put this thing down. This is what I did with my hands. I did a Kung Fu pose. <laughs> now honestly, I've never done Kung Fu training at all, ever in my life. The only thing I knew about Kung Fu was about that uh, TV show starring David Carradine and Kung Fu. I used to watch that before I became a monk. And I did that. Now they saw a bald-headed, brown-robed monk making a Kung Fu pose. They didn't know what Kung Fu really was. So they actually they parted and they let me walk right through them. That was so kind of weird. I will never do that again, I'll get in really big trouble. I don't know anything about Kung Fu. But nevertheless, I think it's just the peace and the calm also. Mainly you, you didn't elicit violence in anybody.
So those emotions, some are useful for you, many of them just get you into more trouble. So learn to peace and trust. And then you don't need to regulate emotions. You get to know them, make peace with them, then they make peace with you. Make sense? Okay, thank you. Yes? Boredom. You know, boredom is really fascinating. Have you ever done an investigation into boredom? I don't know any university scholars here, but you know, sometimes you can do a, a, get a PhD on the nature of boredom. It's actually what it is. Where does it come from? How does it feel? How does it appear in your body? How does it appear in your mind? Boredom is one of the most interesting subjects. So once you get interested in it, of course, it's not boring anymore. Of course you can do different things. I'll teach you how to do different things. Just a simple thing. When you meditate, now, close your eyes, be the in and out three times. After three, three times, open your eyes. Now, I'm pretty sure you breathe in first and then out. In, out, in, out. Now I'm going to ask you to close your eyes again, but do three breaths, but out first, then in. Close your eyes, breathe out first, then in. Out first, then in. Out first, then in. And then open your eyes. It's actually different. It shouldn't be. But it is. <coughs> so it's very easy to put variety in your life. <laughs> so, whatever you're doing, you can always see it in a different way, from a different angle. But in life is not boring and repetitive when you become more aware and happy. You see so much more in things that you never saw before. This is one of the reasons why, when you live this type of life, you actually do become so wise and happy for reasons which other people can't understand. And the reason is because your awareness grows stronger, you literally see more, you hear more, your taste becomes deeper. Okay, I'm going to gross you out now, but I love this story. Here we go, I think they'll probably chuck me out afterwards. Okay. Okay. Very good. So anyway, when I was teaching a meditation retreat over in Perth, meditation was getting really deep. I was teaching it, but I was also meditating. And as I was meditating deeply, got beautiful states of mind. But also, I had to go to the toilet. I'm a human being. And it was to perform what we call a number two. You know what number two is, don't you? Okay, good. So I went to the toilet and sat down and did a number two. And I made a big mistake. Instead of just flushing, you know, the piece of feces down the toilet, I stopped and looked at it. And I'm not exaggerating. People think I'm stupid and exaggerating, but I'm not. That was the most beautiful piece of shit I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> now don't laugh, have you ever investigated this? It's not just one colour brown. The darker browns and lighter browns and the way they were all complementing each other. It was just some like work of art, by, like a Da Vinci or something. And just the way it was all put together, you know, it, was, it was like a sculpture. And there was a little bit of, I don't know, phlegm or something on there. That was like diamond, it made it shine in, in, the, in the light. And then, we go on to the fragrance. Now, you know, in my life, you know, you don't go out with people, but people do wear perfume. 
And sometimes that perfume you smell from people or deodorant is so fake. But this aroma, this was like <laughs> real. It was real, it was deep and powerful. You could relate it to nature. And this became the most beautiful, what they call, do they still call it in England? T-U-R-D? Turd? Most beautiful turd which I've ever seen in my life. And I was so impressed by it, I did actually think, I'm being honest with you, to pick it out from the toilet and show it to my friends. <laughs> it looked beautiful. And it was very hard for me to let it go. <laughs> but that's what I do all the time, I train how to let go. So I put my finger on the button on the top, I can't do it. Two or three times I had to put my finger on there. <laughs> Before I thought, okay, uh, no, no, okay, and I pressed the button. And one of the most beautiful things I've ever... <laughs> yes, right? It went out of my life forever. I was so sad. <laughs> now, that is truthful. How can a piece of feces look so beautiful and attractive? That's actually what happens. That's what I mean by rebelling against everything else anybody ever told you. When you rebel against that, you can see beauty where you never expected it. Delight, joy in things which are ordinary. And that's actually where we get a lot of our happiness from. What is beauty? Real beauty is what your mind adds to what you see, what you feel, what you hear, what you taste. After one retreat, the first breakfast I had was baked beans. And I just took one bean on a spoon, one baked bean, put it in my mouth. That was like a taste explosion. You know, the not the aroma, but the taste of it. You know, the tomato sauce on the outside, it wasn't too sweet, it wasn't too acidic, and it's had this incredible taste to it. And I was so aware that you could actually feel everything. When you crush a bean between your teeth, you crush it so slowly and it just melted into your gums. And that was amazing, that was just one baked bean. Thanks to Mr. Hines. I thought, I never expected things to taste so amazing just from a can. And that's true. How can beauty, good taste happen? It's because your mind gets like cleansed in meditation. And if there's any sort of scholars here, I always like quoting William Blake. S sorry? Oh, very quickly, yeah. To see a world in a grain of sand, see a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. This is where your perceptions just change, you challenge them. It's amazing where you can see delight and beauty, happiness, joy. Everything you ever wanted right here in Birmingham. So one of the reasons I say I'm here, <laughs> Is it over time? Okay, very quick. One of the reasons I'm over here is actually to raise more awareness to one of the challenges which I did, one of the rebellious things I did, which was to ordain bhikkhunis, fully ordained nuns. And now we have, how many fully ordained bhikkhunis in England? One. This is the only one in the whole country. <laughs> She's protected species. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, we have a nice uh, place for her to live over in Oxford. But it needs support. There's so many things that monks and nuns can't do. So one of the things is feeding them. So our feeding times are in the morning. People go to the zoo to feed, <laughs> <laughs> to feed animals. So surely you can feed nuns. So anyway, the feeding time is in the morning about 11 o'clock. Yeah. 
Okay, to the rest. If you take me, I might multiply. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more nuns, yeah. Not just my own class, because my heart has to get to grow. It's because I'm a teacher. But I will duplicate. Yeah. Duplicate, can you say that? Yeah, sure, yeah. And that means we have opportunities for more women to live this life. It may not be you, but it's worthwhile supporting. So there's many bhikkhunis in the world. But it's nice they're coming back again, it's historic. So that's one of the reasons here, to create the awareness. If any of you are interested, please get on Anukampa Bhikkhuni. I can uncover a project here. So you can uh, find a brief piece on the side about what we're doing, what the big part of what we're doing is bringing Ajahn Brahm to England every year. And we organise the next hour teachers and the Jokamali and also me. And we have regular online um, Zoom sessions that you can come to and learn more about the Buddha's teachings and really be involved in the building community. This is really the heart of what we do. So it's not just for the sake of months and months practicing and having a happy life, but it's also filling that happiness. And enabling many people of all kinds of traditions, cultures, you know, genders, as we said, and every age. And just making a place that you can find out some rest and maybe go inside to find out happiness. It's really good. So I think this is one of the things that everybody's missing, you know, in life, including me. You know, we talk about boredom and the mundane of everyday life. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And if you want to understand what sadhu means, it means awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what do you want? <laughs> 